Amid a backdrop of coronavirus and forced cancellations, the 2020 Formula 1 season will have a slightly delayed start. But nevertheless, I'm joined by Ben Anderson and Stuart Codling to talk about the 2020 runners and riders for the season coming up ahead, whenever that may begin, of course. So welcome back to our season prediction countdown. We've done our 6th to 10th and now it's 5th to 1st. And so 5th, which is kind of the middle ground, we've gone for McLaren this year. Now McLaren vastly improved last season, but we just think that perhaps someone else will overtake them in the midfield battle, but again, quietly going about their business and testing. Ben, what did you see from them? Yeah, McLaren a different team now to the one that was shambling around with uh, Honda engines in the back. Um, they've learned a lot, I think, from that tumultuous period and had a bit of a reset. Um, I think last year, finishing fourth in the championship, science being sixth in the drivers' championship was a, an overachievement for them. I'm not sure they were expecting to be quite so good so soon. Um, that gives them a really solid foundation, I think, for this year. Um, they'll be in the fight for best of the rest, I think. Um, fourth in the championship should be the target, um, but it will be more competitive than last year because you have teams like Racing Point, who've been through a, a really difficult time of their own, starting to settle down. Um, they can't discount their works partner team, Renault, if they get on top of some of the problems we've been talking about earlier in the video, then they're going to be a threat. But yeah, McLaren looks solid. They're a well-run operation under Andreas Seidel, and um, the car looks good from trackside. They've got problems with understeer at low speed that seem quite fundamental. They weren't able to dial them out during Barcelona testing. Maybe they will in time for Melbourne, but through the medium speed, S's turn seven and eight, Barcelona, that looked like the most impressive of the midfield cars. So there's some real strengths there for them to, to build on. And they've been very good over the past season or two in terms of building an understanding of where the car's strong, where it's weak. Whereas in previous seasons, we saw particularly in the Honda era, where their messaging was all, we've got the second best chassis in Formula One, we're just saddled with this terrible engine. Then when he put a different engine in, it was only then that they realised actually the car wasn't working as a whole. They seem to have got on top of that. They understand how the car's working. And we saw James Key, the new technical director at the launch, saying they've been able to take on the design of the car. So although this is very much sort of the son of last year's car, there's a lot of things that they weren't able to try in the previous architecture. They've also done a lot sort of behind the driver from basically the side pods and the bulkhead back it's an almost entirely new car in terms of the aero. So I think we can be cautiously optimistic that they're going to be certainly in that fight for fourth. But as I said with Renault, you just can't take these things for granted. And McLaren developed well through last year as well. The, the car began with some handling problems that they were able to dial out. Uh, and also operationally, they've sharpened up a lot. You know, their pit stops are a lot better. I know Lando Norris had a few unfortunate incidents last year with wheels being loose, but generally speaking, McLaren a lot uh, more on it as a race operation, so um, some encouraging signs for that team. Yeah. They don't take stupid strategic gambles either, do they? So although you say you look at the, the German Grand Prix where some people gambled and benefited and McLaren maybe didn't go for that, actually in, in certain circumstances in races like that, if, if you're taking a gamble, that's, it's, it's still a bad strategic play, even if, even if you happen to finish on the podium because you've just taken a flyer, that's still not necessarily a, a clever strategic play. It's just a gamble. So the thing you see with McLaren nowadays is that they're very sharp and they don't take silly risks in order to sort of make these sort of big bet plays. No, and they're thinking long term as well. They're about the big picture, getting back to being amongst the, the leading teams in Formula One where they used to be. So. You know, whether they're fourth one year, fifth one year, sixth another, while they're in that rebuilding phase, which is more than one or two seasons, it's not really going to make any odds to them. Now, we're getting towards the sharp end now, and number four, we think it's going to be Racing Point. Now, they were a mainstay of this position back in the Force India days, and with a very familiar looking car, um, we think that they'll be there again. So, Ben, take it away. Yeah, uh, Racing Point. Um, a lot of buzz about this team this season because of you know the car looking so much like uh, a Mercedes in pink livery. Um, obviously, they have a close technical collaboration with Mercedes and taking the rear end um, to build their car around. Um, looked very impressive actually in in Barcelona. Um, I was more impressed in uh, medium speed corners with the McLaren, but overall the Racing Point is probably the standout performer. Certainly, McLaren seem to think so and there was a feeling they were holding back some of their performance as well um, which all points to them being potentially uh, maybe not in a gap ahead of the midfield but possibly uh, certainly at the head of it to start with um, 
And also, I remember uh, seeing a, a long run, um, I think it was Sergio Perez chasing Sebastian Vettel around on the penultimate afternoon. And the Ferrari was quicker over that distance, uh, but there wasn't much in it. He had to work very hard to close the gap. So uh, encouraging start for Racing Point. Um, you'd certainly expect them to start the season strongly. And then it's a case of how much have they got in the tank to develop that car versus pouring resources into 2021. I think what the other teams need to be worried about is the level of understanding they seem to be demonstrating with that concept already, because every team hires photographers to take spy shots of other cars on the track. Every team has that capacity to be able to copy what other people are doing. It's very easy to copy someone else's car, much harder to actually understand why every single part of that car is working together to create such a competitive package. So for me, it is quite impressive that they seem to have understood basically the essentials of, of what makes the Mercedes fast. Now, Zach Brown for, of, of McLaren has complained that, uh, it, or he's, he's said rather, that uh, if all you do is copy last year's Mercedes, you're always just going to be fighting for fourth place in the championship. I think Racing Point are going to be quite happy to be fourth in the championship and their strategy with this car this year is to get as many points as they can straight off the bat, maybe add one or two performance steps to it, and then really just focus on 2021. So assuming they've got this car right now, then I think they're, they're pretty much on for that fourth place in the championship. I think the understanding of the concept is the key point, actually, because Mercedes have, since the, the enhanced aerodynamic regulations first came in in 2017, Mercedes always seem to have the more complicated aerodynamic structures and they've gone down paths that other teams at the front even haven't copied and yet still ended up uh, dominating championships so why have those other teams not copied them they must be difficult to understand and the, the thing for Racing Point is well they might be able to start with a decent car that's a, a step ahead of their midfield competitors maybe but where can they go with it have they truly understood it and we'll only know that once we get into a sequence of, of consecutive races. Now for third place and this was the team that we you know, famously suggested would win uh, the championship last year but it just hasn't gone well for them and it's Ferrari. Gents, uh, a few problems in pre-season testing um, and it doesn't all look particularly rosy for Ferrari. No, it looks like we're kind of eating humble pie compared <laughs> to 2019 pre-season. Of course, even Mercedes, with their own analysis, thought Ferrari were going to be ahead going to the first race. And it was only because Mercedes unlocked the setup of their new car on the final day that they were able to compete uh, at the front. Um, but this pre-season, Ferrari went in with a strategy of being a lot more conservative and, and not trying to believe too much their own propaganda. Uh, but I think they're also having a difficult time. Uh, Sebastian Vettel talked about the new car having too much drag because they'd focused on improving the cornering performance. But there's a feeling also that the reason it has too much drag is a function of the engine not being powerful enough, which is perhaps related to uh, this issue they've had with the FIA in the 2019 investigation that the other teams are up in arms about. Um, and also, fundamentally, the Ferrari chassis, it looks imbalanced. Um, I was watching trackside for a long time on the the third to last day, the penultimate day of pre-season testing, and there was understeer in that car in many types of corners, quite clearly compared to the to the, the other front runners, if you like. Um, and that's not something they've been easily able to dial out. Vettel was complaining about it the first week of testing, so um, some difficulties there. Maybe a, a, a fundamental problem with the aerodynamics. There was some talk that they were having problems at Maranello with the development of the car or the aerodynamics uh, pre-season. Um, so I certainly don't see Ferrari starting the year, unless they've got loads of hidden performance that they've been sitting on uh, during testing, starting the year fighting uh, Red Bull and Mercedes at the front. A lot of our contacts in Italy are saying that, particularly at the front end, there just hasn't been enough development. And um, Giorgio Piola said to me that one guy had actually told him that there were parts from the 2017 car that would still fit on the, the 2020 car. That sounds ridiculous and probably is, but actually when, when you look at the current car, it, it visibly hasn't moved on over the past few seasons. When you look at other teams, Mercedes, McLaren even, Renault have got a much slimmer nose treatment. The Ferraris is quite broad. And in an era of convergence, you would expect that something would happen in that department. When you, you would see the nose getting a little bit narrower um, just through for aerodynamic efficiency, uh, if, if nothing else. So they've either not seen fit to change it or 
if had so much work. power they haven't needed yeah they to. haven't needed it <laughs> you remember the days of the, the the mclaren hondas of yore with v12s where the, <laughs> they had wings the size of a barn door in 1989 and 1990 because they had so much power so maybe they felt they haven't needed it but it just kind of looks like an, an undeveloped car in some respects in other respects they've taken the design on but in other areas it looks like it's stagnated so uh, it's very very difficult to read and certainly the auguries are not of a team that's massively confident. And now in second, a team that has changed things around for the new season, we've gone for Red Bull. Now, Red Bull, not quite on the pace of the top team, um, but looking very, very good in testing. Yeah, the car looked really, really good from trackside. Um, probably the easiest of all the cars uh, to drive. I'd be very encouraged if I was Max Verstappen. Um, the big question mark, as always, is the Honda engine. Um, They've certainly been very happy with the numbers they've been seeing from the Sakura dynos over the winter. It looked like they were running in quite a conservative engine mode uh, in testing for the most part, certainly the part that I saw. Um, if there's a lot of performance in that engine that they can call upon when it, it you know, comes to the crunch, I think uh, that could be a very, very competitive proposition, possibly on the Mercedes level. Um, it's hard to say at the moment, but um, certainly that's the target. Um, and it would be nice to see Red Bull compete across a greater spread of tracks and Certainly this is their best chance for, for many years, I think, to, to take the, the fight to um, Mercedes for the championship. Yeah, every so often it would look a bit edgy, but not consistently enough for you to think that there was an inherent problem. It was maybe just uh, the point they were in their run or if they'd leaned on the car too much at any given time. For, for me, the, the most encouraging sign was uh, in, in the least interesting part of the circuit, which is the chicane, which is very slow and not, not one that relies on downforce. The car just looked very agile through there. And, and that's a point of the circuit where very often you see other cars having problems with heave and, and other associated things with the chassis. It just looked like it changed direction very quickly, even when it wasn't requiring downforce to do so, which, it's not an element of the performance envelope that you need every part of a racing circuit, but it shows that in, in some departments where they were weak in the past, they seem to have found something. That's something that they were really focused on over the winter as well. I mean, we, we saw that Red Bull appear with a, a new suspension setup. Um, previously, they were the strongest at low speed and they felt uh, last year, certainly, that they'd lost that status to Mercedes. Um, and it made it much more difficult for them to be competitive at places like Monaco, which were a Red Bull stronghold, even in the, the Renault engine era for them. Um, they've, so they've worked very hard to kind of recapture that advantage. And the feeling is that uh, they've delivered um, with this car so far. So expect them to be a lot stronger where um, previously they'd started to show a bit of weakness. And so our tip for first, last, but definitely not least, is Mercedes. Now. This car has looked pretty imperious in testing so far. Um, there's a lot to say about it. Um, take it away, gents. Yeah, it's hard to look past Mercedes for favourite. Um, I think the Red Bull Honda is close, maybe a match in terms of chassis performance. Engine, we can't really say yet until Honda have turned everything up. Um, there's maybe one potential weakness on the Mercedes side with the engine reliability. They had some shutdowns related to the, the oil system on the works cars and we mentioned earlier Williams had the same problem. So if that's a, a systemic problem, then that could pose difficulties for them heading into the early races. Um, but other than that, I mean, as you said, they, they look imperious and they're on this roll really where um, They've been so successful that they can afford to, to focus on next year's car, but maybe a little bit earlier than some of their rivals. And that just feeds into a success loop where they can then do the same the following year. Um, last year, Ferrari were developing their car so late into the season to try and get on, on top of some of the problems they had. Um, Red Bull, likewise, perhaps not to quite the same extent. They're better prepared this year than they have been previously. But Mercedes, I mean, they were so far ahead last year, they could focus on this car very, very early. Uh, and you would expect them to start the season very strongly as a result. It was very rare that you saw any signs of that car being driven at the limit. Every time you saw the onboards, no matter what tyre they were on, it was as if whoever was driving it was just out for a Sunday cruise, wasn't it? Just fingertips at the wheel, nothing really difficult going on, no no snaps to try and control. Only it pulling was, DAS on and off. Exactly, that whole thing. You know, we, we, we were all so focused on sort of watching that, we didn't see this. So, and, and I think, I wonder if this whole business of DAS has 
distracted us from the fact that the car is just naturally very good. Uh, it, there, there was no point where it looked like it was under duress. Both drivers looked imperious, if I can um, have a full house of use of that word. We've now, now <laughs> used the word imperious to describe it. They just didn't look like they were trying particularly hard and still really, really quick. So like Ben says, you can't really look past them. Well, that's it, everybody. Let us know in the comments what you think the order will be. And thank you for watching.